them uh, on the, the green paper that you all have on your, on your tables. So um, very pleased now to introduce our panelists. And you can find their full bios in your packets. First, um, we'll hear from Jillian Woolett, who is a principal research scientist at Avalier Health, where she leads the FDA practice. She is a trained immunologist and previously held positions uh, at Engel and Novit Bio and Pharma. She has her doctorate in immunology from University of Oxford and degrees in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge. Next, we will hear from Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg, who is a faculty member at the Duke University School of Medicine, where she serves as director of the Marcus Center for Cellular Cures, the Pediatric Blood and Marrow Transplant Program, and the Carolinas Cord Bank Cord Blood Bank. She is also the co-director of the Stem Cell Laboratory at Duke. She's an internationally renowned expert in pediatric hematology and oncology, pediatric blood and marrow transplantation, umbilical cord blood banking and transplantation, and novel applications of cord blood in the emerging fields of cellular therapies and regenerative medicine. And she's going to bring us into um, what it means to actually translate from the uh, bench to the bedside. Um, if you will. Um, next, we're pleased to um, welcome John Glasspool. Mr. Glasspool is a senior advisor to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Center for Biomedical Innovation, New Digs Initiative, and the Financing and Reimbursement of Cures in the U.S. Project, or FOCUS. He's also the CEO of Anthos Therapeutics. And finally, we have uh, with us Dr. Rena Conti, who is the Associate Research Director of Biopharma and Public Policy for the Boston University Institute for Health System Innovation and Policy. She's also an associate professor at the Boston University Questrom School of Business. Dr. Conti is a health economist whose research focuses on the organization, financing, and regulation of medical care. And she has written extensively on the pricing, demand, and supply of prescription drugs. And I really want to thank our friends from Boston for making it down uh, following a snowstorm, particularly. <laughs> so um, with that being said, very pleased now to turn the conversation over to Jillian Willett. Delighted to be here. Most of you all know Avalier for reimbursement commercialization. We also do have a practice with a bunch of molecular biologists and immunologists and PhD types that have, you know, approached the different form of evidence in the sense of what FDA generally is looking for. But for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to go very broad, very general. Some of you will appreciate Coleman's mustard. It's that lethally hot stuff, and you always put a really big splodge on the plate, but you don't eat it. And they always argue that Coleman's made their money by the mustard left on the plate. Everybody was, had the mustard available, but the point being that just as with some medicines, you have a lot of people treated that leverage the cost, but their response may be different. Our ability to focus who gets a treatment in the first place, as our colleague from Pharma introduced, is critically important, but obviously it changes the economics. So the traditional return on investment for a small molecule drug, if you're treating for blood pressure, what I tend to call, unfortunately, the popular diseases, you have a broader return on investment available to you. Biologics were already breaking this model with the specificity of monoclonal antibodies where you had a tighter diagnosis perhaps of the disease, and then cell gene therapy, which has been a dream for years, ever since we knew the structure of DNA in 52. Cell and gene therapy are really focusing on treating the right person at the right time. So if we look at the complexity, we have the small molecule drugs, obviously small, we have the biologics, which can be quite big, that Y shape, your traditional monoclonal antibody. And then soup, as I call it, which characteristically was not well defined, goes back to 1796 and the smallpox vaccine, but now may include some of these cells, and they may be living entities in and of themselves, which is then a supply chain issue. So yes, complexity is a challenge, but the specificity ultimately determines the economics and historically, and still, much, many of us have high blood pressure, but historically most therapies targeted a disease rather than a person. And the great news is we're getting to the point we can target the person. Obviously biologics are an increasing part of the US pipeline, and the reason I flag this one is you look at the number in the pipeline 
and the number of approvals. And we've got a ratio of about 100 to one. It's about a century to approve at FDA what's already in the pipeline. So maybe we're putting some things into people too soon, or maybe we need to look at our regulatory model. But either way, I think that ratio needs to change. But the expansion of these specialty meds continues to increase. That's good. The promise is there. But it's going to add to the visibility, the cost, and cell and gene therapy even more so. We've already, even without the specificity, the acute, astute specificity, got a move from blockbuster to, to smaller populations that can benefit from each drug. And this means collectively there's an issue on our pipeline. And we've got competition coming with biosimilars for biologics, but it's being very slow. And then here was an observation made by Scott Gottlieb as commissioner that to the individual patient, of course, the improvements are profound, but as measured against GDP, everybody knows the rate of spending is unsustainable. So this choice as to who gets treated becomes critical. And the R&D per product is unchanged, but there's fewer able to benefit. So the access is a exquisitely important question. Here, we've got a rough summary of how the cell therapies may be autologous. They may be self-cells, or in my case, I can borrow from my identical twin, but most of you don't have one. You have to donate your own cells to yourself to be altered in some way, given back to you. And then we have the allogeneic, which is donor essentially in the same manner that you have for tissue transplants. And you get a certain scale up after the manipulation and then administration to the patients. Now, what's important here is, of course, the setting of care is a very complicated situation too. This is not a pill that you can just take. This is the aspect of available, suitable, appropriate settings for care is massively important. And then with the gene therapies, you have the viral vectors that, again, gives the corrected gene to the patient and you hope to restore function. As a regulatory matter, sponsors choose the pathways, but we have two statutes that govern FDA's authority, and then it's a biologics license application under the Public Health Service Act as to how these products get approved, and this is through the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at FDA. This is the center that also deals with blood, blood products, and historically dealt with the recombinant products, but those are now the center of drugs. And philosophically, this is important in how, both as a statutory authority and also how the people available for review approach the approval of these products. It is not a trivial exercise, and it takes a lot of expertise and a lot of working together between the sponsor and the agency to enable a product to be marketed. And everything about a drug becomes a hundredfold for a biologic and becomes a thousandfold for cell and gene therapy in terms of complexity, supply chain, and, and how it gets managed. Here, as alluded to again, are the four approvals. We have the two cell therapies at the top, and then we have a couple of gene therapies at the bottom. These are just a beginning, but it's also evident obviously with the numbers at the bottom of each, that the cost per patient can be quite significant. Then at FDA, there's the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy, better, easier said as RMAC designation that was created in 21st Century Cures Act. And there's certain criteria that allow sponsors to engage in the program, but they're ANDs. These are not alternatives, the drug has certain specific aspects to it. It's intended to treat, modify, reverse, or cure a serious or life-threatening disease or condition. This is important. As we get going into gene therapies, it would be, or cell therapies, it's naive to say everything is gonna be a cure. Just because, in theory, in principle, it can be, does not mean that the first generation will be. There's a lot of learning to be done collectively, individually. So apart from some of the antibiotics, I don't think we've ever had the first gen being instantly perfect and being what we need. So, and then there's also this need for preliminary clinical evidence showing that it has this potential to address the unmet medical needs. So there's a lot of steps before you get into the RMAP program, but it does enable access to a lot more support from the FDA and also the priority review and certain other programs. 
I do have a caution here that by making every drug special, we're leaving out potentially, if we're not careful, those drugs for popular diseases, but clearly some of these are very high touch and they need the FDA engagement throughout the process. However, FDA already has 800 active INDs on file for cell and gene therapies, and it's high touch resource intensive for FDA. So as we look to, say, re-upping of the user fees, we can expect some attention on the resources required by the agency to do the review. They also have at FDA a number of other levers to accelerate review beyond just standard and priority. Here we've indicated fast track, breakthrough, and RMAT. So for sponsors, it's very, very important to talk to the agency, work out what they may be eligible for, and make the most of these programs. And then here we have the pipeline of those products that have the expedited designation. And the FDA is saying they expect they'll receive over 200 INDs per year for cell and gene therapy by 2020. That's next year, shocking though that may be. And approved 10 to 20 per year by 2025. So this is a heads up as to these economic demands on the system, whichever part of the system you are, as to how we're going to manage what should be, will be, ultimately phenomenal therapies, even if the first ones aren't perfect. Oops. So that's an introduction to Cell and Gene. Thanks so much, Jillian. Joanne? So I'm a pediatric um, physician and hematologist on call. I forgot my instructions about the red light. Um, <laughs> um, and I am really speaking from personal experience about uh, cell therapy programs that we are bringing forward in children with brain diseases. I um, want to make a few points, though. You've heard already that these therapies uh, really can be cells, tissues, and genes, that their potential is enormous um, to help exciting, um, uh, with exciting new therapies for unproven applications and unmet medical needs. Um, they're very unique because, as Jillian said, they're not pills. There's manufacturing, there's packaging, there's distribution. Um, and everything about them is really different than drugs. And I'll give you an example. We have a cell therapy study in orthopedics and knee arthritis, and we had to send frozen cells to an orthopedic clinic. Well, orthopedic clinics really don't know how to handle frozen cells, don't have the freezers for frozen cells, don't know how to thaw the frozen cells. So I mean, just putting all that in place took a whole lot of training, teaching, buying of new equipment and different kinds of expertise than is in their typical wheelhouse. Um, and I think these therapies are going to dramatically change the current healthcare system, both in delivery, but there are big gaps in the current workforce, particularly in manufacturing uh, under GMP, um, that really need to be addressed in our whole educational system. Uh, there's different techniques for storing the products that are not in the bandwidth of a typical pharmacy. Um, and administration, as I alluded to, requires very different expertise when you're t talking about cells or genes um, or tissues. Um, so I work in the Market Center for Cellular Cures, which is a translationally focused, scientifically based center in an academic center. And we are developing cell-based therapies to treat brain diseases um, and our goal is to develop the therapies and rapidly translate them from the laboratory to the clinic and to the patient. Um, to do this, we're, we're like a mini biotech in an academic center, which is an oxymoron in itself, um, but somehow we've managed to do that. And so we have a center that has its own research and development and discovery lab, a, a FDA licensed public cord blood bank called the Carolinas Cord Blood Bank, which has 45,000 cord blood units, which were donated by moms uh, to be stored and used for the cell therapy and transplantation, a GMP cell manufacturing lab, clinical trials group, a regulatory group, administrative group, and a physician group. Um, and we are using cord blood, cord tissue, and cord blood-derived cell products 
uh, under IND to study indications in babies with birth asphyxia, children with cerebral palsy and autism, adults with acute ischemic stroke, children with leukodystrophies, um, and um, uh, adults with uh, osteoarthritis of the knee. And I don't have time to go into all this, but I just wanted you to see kind of the scope of what we're doing and uh, where we're coming from. Um, so one of our major focuses is using cord blood cells as therapies, and um, the FDA approval for cord blood is for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation as a cell that can rescue bone marrow after myeloablative therapy. Um, but that property is covered by a cell in the circle at the top called a blood stem cell, which is about 0.001% of the cells in a bag of cord blood. Everybody always says cord blood is a bag of stem cells, and it really is not a bag of stem cells. But it turns out there are a lot of other interesting and potentially therapeutic cells in cord blood, including lymphocytes, which people are now developing into third-party immunotherapies, and the monocytes, which are on the bottom, which is what I'm going to concentrate on today. Um, so cord blood monocytes are different than adult monocytes. So if you take my blood and try to get it to do what cord blood can do, it will not work. And that's what the graphs on the bottom of the slideshow on the right. Um, but on the upper three panels, you can see normal brain tissue and culture. This is mouse brain tissue. And in the middle, injured brain tissue. And then on the right, injured brain tissue that was co-incubated with cord blood monocytes, and it's rescued from what was a hypoxic injury. And we use this kind of data to develop a rationale uh, to put in an IND to try cord blood cells in babies with birth asphyxia and adults with acute ischemic stroke and kids with cerebral palsy. We also grow a cell from cord blood um, we call DUOC, which stands for Duke O-cell, um, which is swimming around on that slide, but which is a monocyte-derived product we grow in the DMP lab over three weeks in culture, and which is capable of remyelinating brain in a number of experimental systems. And that has important applications for treating demyelinating diseases uh, and also for treating children with leukodystrophies. Um, and on the bottom panel, you can see on the left, that the cell has remyelinated brain in a mouse that was injured by uh, something called cuprazone, and that the myelin is of normal integrity. Um, so one of the things I've concentrated on in my life is treating children with rare leukodystrophies. These, when you talk about personalized medicine, these are very rare but fatal diseases that affect infants and young children and um, which we showed about 20 years ago could be uh, affected in a positive way by hematopoietic stem cell transplantation with cord blood. On, on the right, you see a little girl who has Crabbe disease. She had an older sister who died. She was transplanted with cord blood when she was 19 days old, and she is a healthy 15-year-old. On the right, you see a little girl who also had a sibling who died who was transplanted at 21 days of age and who is alive and doing pretty well but has trouble walking. And you can see in the middle uh, MRIs that show fiber tracking of their cortical spinal tracts, which are the nerves that go from the brain to the legs. And the little girl on the left has normal tracts, and the little girl on the right has an abnormal tract. And these were done when these kids were two days old. So what that says is even by two days of age, it's too late to fix everything in some kids. And so we developed a therapy where those duoc cells are now being given to children with leukodystrophies a month after a transplant in the spinal fluid um, to see if it will help rescue the damaged areas of brain more rapidly. Um, and um, we've treated 27 children, whoops, and um, have good safety results, but know that we need to do a trial without transplant to see if there's efficacy, and we're planning to do that in adults with MS. We've also studied cord blood, not with a transplant, but as an infusion, like a smart drug. So we put the cells in the blood, and they do their thing in the body, and we're not 100% in control of what they do, they, but they're smart enough to know. And this just shows you data from a published study in cerebral palsy 
where um, we were able to show that cord blood improved motor function in kids with CP. That's in the middle. And on the bottom, where you see pictures of all those brain lines, that shows that cord blood cells improved or increased motor tracts in the brain in the children whose um, uh, motor function improved after the cord blood infusion. To do those scans, each scan is four terabytes of information. Each child had two scans. Um, <laughs> this is composite of all those kids pre and post. So supercomputers had to analyze that data. The children had to go into MRIs for an hour to be studied twice. So I mean, there's a lot of complexity just to get the kind of data that might convince the FDA that this is a reasonable therapy to move forward. So here's a good example. A little boy, this is a little boy who was a responder on treatment, and we filmed all the children and had them independently evaluated. But he's walking with a walker. He has braces. He can't walk independently at study baseline. But on the bottom, one year later, you can see that he doesn't have the walker. He doesn't need the braces. He can walk independently. That is more than a child would be able to do in a year with straight CP if they didn't have an intervention that made a difference. But it's in growing kids who develop anyway, it's more complex to show a benefit than just saying, oh, he improved in a year. Um, we also are looking at cord tissue therapies. So this is from the umbilical cord itself, not the blood inside. And we were able to show in preparation for studies in kids with autism that cord tissue, MSCs, which stands for mesenchymal stromal cells, which can be grown from cord, from the cord in six weeks in culture in a GMP lab, can calm down inflammation of what are called microglia, which are known to be uh, inflamed in kids with autism. Autism now affects one in 59 children in the US, and it's increasing in incidence and severity. Um, the annual cost to society is in the hundreds of billions, and there is no FDA-approved therapy to treat the core symptoms of autism. We uh, published a study where we showed that giving infusions of autologous cord blood to kids with autism improved in the red on the right, their, uh, or decreased symptoms of autism and improved their behavior. This is open label phase one, so it has to be studied in a randomized placebo-controlled phase two. But if cord blood can help, then you could say, well, this is autologous. How many families actually store their own kids' cord blood? And frankly, I work with cord blood, and I think if this is going to be a, a viable therapy, we have to make it work with donor cells, which can be manufactured more easily, more effectively, and maybe better. So we've done this study. It will be published soon, testing whether donor cells or the child's own cells compared to placebo made a difference. And one thing that we learned is that um, we need objective endpoints, not just, unfortunately, a parent saying their child is better. And so we're looking at one example, which I show here, called eye tracking, which tracks how a child looks at a video, which is different in autistic kids than in um, typically developing kids. But these objective endpoints are hard to find, hard to validate, expensive to implement, but really important to prove or disprove a therapy. So um, because we're academic and because we have small labs and because we want to help children and we, because we don't want the cost to be super high um, to do this, 50% of the kids we see have Medicaid. Um, we, we are looking at market sizes and trying to figure out how to optimize and scale up manufacturing. But for example, if we use cord tissue and we're treating kids with CP, we have about 800,000 doses to make. Um, if we're treating kids with autism, we have three and a half million doses to make. Stroke, six million. Osteoarthritis and knee, 30 million. I have a little lab and one cord tissue can make 1,000 doses. So you, and that takes six weeks. So you can kind of do the math. But if we outsource it and upscale it, it will end up being hundreds of thousands of dollars when it really can cost tens of thousands of dollars a dose. Um, so just to sum up, um, and I didn't have a lot of time to really show you all the data, but we have encouraging early phase data to say that um, cord blood and cord tissue cells can help children with various types of brain injuries, but we have to do phase three 
uh, well-designed studies to confirm efficacy and then to obtain regulatory approvals. Those are long, expensive, and big processes. But these therapies have the potential to treat diseases with unmet needs and to change human lives. And when you make a child better, when you make that child be able to walk alone, it impacts the rest of his whole life. So it's not just that one thing that makes him better. Um, but clinical trials are very expensive. NIH doesn't typically fund the level of phase three that need to be done. Uh, complex endpoints require novel clinical trial designs. Point of care delivery has to be addressed, and the workforce and the competencies to do that have to be developed. Um, and we have to harmonize the FDA regulations and point of care cell therapies because some of the lines in the sand on specifications really don't make any sense. So thank you. Wow, thank you, Joanne. I know we'll have lots of questions. We'll turn to, <laughs> turn to John next. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to really pick up from where Julian and Joanne have been talking and talk about as we move more to the, if these therapies are so successful. Um, how I came to be involved in Focus was I was a head of corporate strategy for a biopharmaceutical company, was so such a believer in this technology that essentially said, well, if this technology is going to work the way we think it's going to work, then we need to change the healthcare system to support that. Um, because whilst the, the science is exciting, the benefit was clear, um, we knew that it would actually take quite some changes within the system in order to get these products used. So the focus project is really about the finance and reimbursement of cures. I think Gillian mentioned the point of whether these things are really cures. The key to me is the difference with these therapies are that they're durable. And their durability, as in that there's an initial treatment with then follow-on benefits, is what makes them very different from other drugs in the system, and I'll highlight that. The focus project itself is very much a mixture of all stakeholders involved in the delivery of healthcare. So it obviously is drug developers, but it's also the payers, the providers, the regulators. And the goal of the key overall is to make sure that these innovative cures are accessible to patients. So patient access is the guiding star of the whole project. But the fact is that we believe it needs to be sustainable to all the stakeholders. So if patient access is going to be achieved, whatever system changes we come up with need to support all parts of the stakeholder system. So it, the overall pathway which we undertake at MIT is what's called a design lab, where everything we work on is obviously, it's MIT, so it's highly systemized and uh, measured. But the group, there's over 50 organizations, 150 individuals, and as I say, covers all of the key stakeholders involved in, in drug development. Gillian mentioned the pipeline, um, uh, rather, Jocelyn mentioned the pipeline in the beginning of 300 products. What we've said is overall, if we apply normal attrition rates, there will certainly be significantly more products in the coming years. The next slide shows you this difference between durable therapies and classical medicines. If you take a blood pre pressure medication, the benefit and the cost really move in parallel, very much like rent in a house. You live in the house, you pay the rent. All is well and good. Durable therapies have this acute cost point, um, where, which is much more like buying a house. So there's an acute cost point, but you get the benefit from the medicine over time. And that's the key difference, this acute cost with an assessment and an assumption of the accrual of benefit. So that p gives us then three financing challenges. One is that payment timing, which is a one-time high cost. Um, the performance risks, which I'm going to cover, which is there's an assumption around the value, and obviously that value is determined by the effectiveness and the durability, given the fact we say those are durable therapies. And obviously with these diseases being rare, there's an actuarial risk with a non-normal distribution of who in the population is going to suffer from these conditions. I should say at this point, to be clear, that the focus of focus is on the finance solutions. It isn't about setting the value per se. So we're not involved in the value assessment. But once the values are agreed, how do we make sure patients get access to the medicines? However, in order to enter this debate, you need to understand what do we think about value and not price setting. And I think there's some key elements here. Value is benefits uh, minus costs. 
However, the delta at the end says because of that patient variability that is inevitable uh, in, this, in these conditions, that there's going to be variability on costs and there's going to be variability on benefits. So if one's in a value-based world and you're setting a scheme to, to optimize value, then you need to take into account that actually there will be differences between value rather than just an average value. So if we use Gillian's mustard analogy, we need to make sure that the heat is the right heat and not the uh, variance <coughs> in heat that was assumed. The other key factor is that we're talking about many different conditions, and this is definitely an area one size does not fit all. So we talk about gene and cell therapies, but when we're thinking about what is the burden on the system, how many patients need to get access, is there gonna be a surge of demand for product? We need to look at the specific condition. What is the morbidity and mortality? What is the population incidence? What is the population backlog? And what are the current treatment alternatives and costs? <coughs> And from that, that will drive different assessments of the need from a healthcare perspective. So no one size fits all. And I think what's important is when we look at what we call cure archetypes from oncology, novel breakthroughs to quantum leaps, which is large diseases, based on the epidemia of the condition, who actually covers those conditions varies markedly. So obviously for diseases where it's a, a pediatric patient, they're gonna be covered roughly 50% by Medicaid and 50% by commercial plans. Obviously, if it's a disease of the elderly, it'll be probably be Medicare. So thinking through the disease helps you also think through who's the likely payer and what are the system challenges we have in order to put a solution in place for, for that particular disease, given the disease incidence and prevalence. And so the goal of the financial tools is to make sure that we get to the, this precision financing and we deliver the value that's assumed, and that when people are paying for value, it is value achieved. There are three ways that we feel at uh, Focus MIT is to do that. One is short-term milestone-based contracts, and this is where specific payments are tied clearly to outcomes. So Jocelyn, in her introduction, mentioned that companies are moving in this direction. I personally am a big believer that you know, the healthcare system we have is built on paying for inputs. What did you receive? What diagnostic did you receive? What drug did you receive? It needs to move to paying for actually outcomes. And obviously when you're talking about this value, both in terms of clinical value to patients and then in terms of that accrued benefit leading to a higher cost, it's really important that you do actually pay the value that has been achieved. The second one then is multi-period performance. We talked about that it's more like buying a house rather than renting a house. And so here, this is annuity payments based over a number of years, likely three to five years to spread that cost. And then the third tool that we feel is appropriate would be an orphan reinsurer benefit manager that can carve these patients out given their rarity, given that actuarial risk, and manage them independently of the rest of the population. And overall, we believe that these solutions need to be customized for each disease and satisfy each stakeholder. The regulatory and policy landscape which we, which we feel may hinder, or more positively, if we can adapt it, will actually enable these changes to take place with regards to um, annual annuities, with regards to milestone-based contracts and value programs and all of the following. The key, one of the key ones is the drug price reporting and rebate. Um, there's some key changes here adapting to multi-year performance structures. So normally, obviously, those rebates are in a given financial year. How do we manage that when it's across multiple years? And then by understanding the rebate system for these and making sure the value-based assessment doesn't overly impact Medicaid best price, allowing greater risk-taking. So rather than the a greater risk can be taken if we recognize there may be some patient failures if that failure doesn't lead then to a catastrophic drop in the Medicaid best price. And an example of this could be weighted assessments of performance versus a single, a single case performance. <clears throat> Anti-kickback statutes have been a concern. However, obviously, as you've seen recently, this is definitely an area of work in progress. 
And there's been uh, recent announcements that this is being developed and worked on, so I've grayed that out. FDA communication guidelines to enable appropriate performance metrics. Joanne, in her talk, talked about the complexity of measuring some of these conditions and the ability to measure improvements. And what we need to be very clear of is that the endpoints that may be acceptable to regulators may not be of the most value to patients and may not be the easiest to measure for payers. And so understanding that and understanding the fact of how will we actually capture that value in a value-based agreement um, is critically important. And then making sure that the FDA doesn't pen penalize people for talking about endpoints which aren't actually in the label, but are directly tied to the clinical outcomes that are important would be a huge benefit. Clearly, as we're talking about individual patient performances, and we clearly want to keep patient privacy front, front and foremost, making sure that HIPAA guidelines enable data visibility to the involved par parties without exposing patients is important. And finally, making sure that insurance regulations are appropriate, deductibilities and copay waivers may not be appropriate for these, these acute uh, durable conditions. So that's the focus project, and I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Thanks, John. All right, Rena, bring it home. No pressure. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, and thank you to the Alliance for this incredibly um, inspiring panel. So um, just by way of introduction, um, I'm a health economist. Before I was uh, faculty at BU's Questrom School of Business, I was faculty at the University of Chicago and held an appointment in the Pediatrics, Hematology, Oncology Department. It was there um, under the tutelage of my department chair, who is a stem cell um, uh, biologist, that I really started to understand the true breakthroughs that we are on the precipice of having for children, um, but also for people, for adults as well. And um, it also inspired some work that I'm doing right now on trying to understand the financial toxicity and the access points um, or problems that people are facing um, in accessing this therapy, these therapies for people with um, blood cancers in addition to other uh, very high cost but potentially high value therapies as well. The other thing that you should note is that I, as a card carrying economist, I have a tattoo of a, a pocket protector in my, I swear. <laughs> I, um, I'm a voting member of ICER. And um, because of my interest in pediatrics in particular, um, I've really become very sensitive to the way in which cost-effectiveness analysis is applied to pediatric populations and very rare disease populations. Um, I will be a voting member of the committee that reviews the first stem cell therapy that comes out in a couple of months. And then lastly, I should tell you that I have a very long-standing interest in the financing of cures. And I mean cures in a very specific context, as in we know it when we see it, true mortality and or morbidity gain that is, um, that is uh, durable, as James said. We have cures already. Including, for vaccine, including those embodied in vaccines. So they're not new concepts. Um, and one should think about the financing and organization of cures in that context as well. As part of that longstanding interest, I am part of a team that, is, that proposed the first ever subscription model to provide um, guaranteed access to everyone insured by Medicaid and also the state prison population who are infected with hepatitis C and eligible for treatment under the, DA, the current new, newly available DAAs. That subscription model, you may have heard in the news, is being piloted in the state of Louisiana. We've already treated something like 1,500 people. And, um, and it's based on that very exciting new development that I think we can actually make some progress here in thinking about how do we actually finance this and think about this moving forward. Lastly, I'm a card-carrying economist. So I'm really, my 
comments are uh, really meant to think about first principles. What's different? What's the same here for these therapies? And I promise there will be no math. OK. Oops. Oh, no. OK. OK. So the first thing that is very important about these therapies is that we're all in it together. By definition, these are acts of God. And the diseases and the therapies that make us eligible for treatment are ones for which really we have no control over based on our own personal behavior. It has everything to do with our biology. From that, a lot of the other pieces flow. So my really agenda is to think about the three economic challenges. Some of them are true market failures to getting people access to needed, valuable prescription drug-based care, and really to highlight the disease, the leadership opportunities to improve access. And here, my goal is to improve access both for therapies that exist now, but also for therapies that are on the horizon. So there are three economic challenges. The first is innovation. The second is financing treatment for all eligible patients. And the last is crony capitalism. I'm going to start in reverse order. So um, in panels relating to drugs and drug access, it's very common that we start thinking about all the greedy actors. And the one that I really want to focus on here is um, our system writ large and not really focus on any one particular actor. It'll become obvious in a second why. So, the pricing of these products currently is around $400,000 to $800,000 a pop. Um, uh, Medicare sets reimbursement for these products. And currently, for the, for the currently available CAR-T therapies that are being treat, uh, they're used to treat leukemia, the right level of reimbursement has been set at approximately $200,000. But this begs a different question, which is, what exactly is the right level of spending on prescription drugs versus all the other things that one can do to make people healthy? And just again from first principles, this likely varies by the productivity of the input, but also of the output. What I mean by that is we should pay more for things that are more productive. We shouldn't waste money on stuff that isn't productive to improving our this view can conflict with physician and hospital culture and also market power. So one of the things that's really important to understand about the sticker price of these products is that on top of the sticker price related to the drugs are the hospital costs, the physician costs, the diagnostic costs, and all the other ancillary costs, which can double or even triple the bill that the ultimate payer, us, will face. <clears throat> now, in most consumer products, new technology purports to make things cheaper for us. And that's because it substitutes labor and reduces costs in other ways. That doesn't happen commonly in medical care. Why? Because there are other forces at play that try to capture the value of these products of this new technology. So one of the things that just came out recently is that hospitals have, um, some hospitals have announced that only academic medical centers should be actually making stem cells. Why? Well, in part it's to further research. Another part is to assure the quality of the, of the processes. The other part is to capture rents and cut pharma out as much as they can. Um, similarly, we've seen efforts um, by uh, hospitals to try to um, think about different sites of care for the treatment, for the use of these therapies. Again, one way of thinking about that is, oh, we want to make sure that patients who are getting these therapies um, are really benefiting from them um, in the most high-level controlled setting. Another is opportunities for rent-seeking. <clears throat> Probably those two motives are existing at the same time. Um, the way in which um, CMS 
and payers typically tend to think about how to control this type of rent seeking is by bundled payments. And bundled payments make sense here, but particularly they make sense where costs are uncertain, um, where the benefits of therapy may or may not actually um, accrue um, to the patient and or there is this opportunity for rent seeking, which we worry about, which kind of endlessly pushes the budget out for this, spent, for this therapy, or when follow-on innovation is not key, a key concern. Here, CMS was actually quite prescient, I think, in trying to understand exactly what the costs were. They required um, cost reporting in addition to risk reporting by the hospitals that were using this therapy. They also are allowing off-label use of these therapies, which I think is incredibly important to really think through, think through what exactly is the benefit of these therapies, not just for the indicated patient population, but for others as well. Oops, keep on doing this. Okay, what about the challenging financing access to cures? <clears throat> Bottom line is that very high prices or very large eligible patient populations or both can create liquidity constraints. And that can happen for patients who are individually responsible for their therapy or for payers. This might be related to the mismatch and timing between treatment costs and benefits. As um, James suggested, um, there's clearly an upfront bolus of spend here um, that needs to be financed somehow. <clears throat> better insurance, better coverage, better guaranteed access is a solution to all financing challenges that look like this. Um, this includes insurance covered mandates, but also lower out of pocket costs. There is no economic reason why people should be paying deductibles and copayments for therapies that are durable cures. Having skin in the game will not make you a better shopper of therapy. Um, approximately 15% uh, of patient population here is insured by Medicaid in general for these therapies, but it's entirely possible in these subpopulations and the application of these specific diseases that actually Medicaid is actually the insurer for the vast majority of therapies. Medicaid programs have their own budgetary constraints that are annualized. They can't borrow money from the bank and pay it back later. Um, this even though that there are requirements for state Medicaid agencies to provide access, they don't in practice. We know this in CART-T, we're seeing this in other types of new therapies as well. And truly, my nightmare scenario is a sickle cell cure for which some states provide access, others slow walk access, some insurers in a state provide access, others do not. The dynamics attached to that and the optics attached to that are unacceptable. Finally, the challenge of innovation. Um, the people who are doing this type of work, they're doing God's work here. Um, yes, there's fame and glory attached to doing this type of work, but oh my God, they are curing kids. Amazing, truly amazing. And um, they do face time and inconsistent preferences by payers. Willing developers want to make these therapies, they want to deliver cures, but once they deliver them, they know that they're gonna get bargained down to lower prices, particularly when the government is paying. Because of that, we believe that innovation actually is, um, is less than it should be. Um, and we reward innovation with higher revenue, patient, more revenue for patients, higher prices, or lower innovation costs and other risks still may not be enough to get all the cures that we really want to have happen. Um, I'm gonna sum up with just some observations on leadership, and I'll make this quick, I promise. Um, <clears throat> the first is that improving insurance resolve most access challenges for patients. This, by necessity, requires shifting money around. That's what insurance does. It's a forced saving mechanism between periods of healthy states to periods of sick states between healthy people and sick people. We need to find a way of, of, of sharing those risks and there are ways of going about doing this that don't break the bank. 
Um, reimbursement policies provide opportunities to reduce super additive costs with sub -additive, additive benefit. We should be really looking to optimize what the prices are of the therapies, but also matching the right ancillary costs with the, um, and really looking for opportunities to stop spending money on stuff that really doesn't make that much difference um, in the lives of these patients. And then lastly, we really need to send clear signals to innovators that we care about cures and that what actually constitutes true, meaningful innovation. Um, we likely need some guidance here on uh, what is a cure, but also um, regarding how to think about setting price regarding to cost effectiveness and also effectiveness. From my perspective, you do not need an outcomes-based contract if you are providing a true and obvious cure. There, the only problem is how to provide access to the people who need it and at what price are we going to do it. In other words, it's essentially a quantity commitment in exchange for a lower net price that the manufacturer provides with no guarantee of durability, accessibility, et cetera. Uh, we have models for doing this. We do this in vaccines. We do this in hepatitis C, and we'll do it in other therapies as well. Finally, um, there is some controversy over whether or not we need to really revise our Medicaid rebate rules, our 340B discounts, and others. What I would argue is that subscription models that exist or quantity commitments in exchange for lower prices already exist and they did not require revisions to these rules. And so it's not obvious that they do need to be revised and it's something that should be considered more generally. I will sum by saying we are all in this together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, can we give our panel a round of applause before we even get to the questions? <laughs> um, that was, that was amazing, and we are going to have about half an hour for your questions, um, so I really hope that uh, you'll think about clarifying questions or bigger questions, write them down, um, we'll, we'll come around and, and pick them up. For those, be, um, before you head out, um, if you do have to head out, do fill out your evaluation form and tell us what else you want to learn. Um, all right, so let me, let me kind of start us off um, while the questions are coming up. I want to start with like, I mean, we literally just watched a video of a child walking. That's absolutely amazing. And then we, um, we also heard words like safety, you know, safety and efficacy and durability. And um, I, I want us to get into a little bit, how do we make sure the systems are set up to, to ensure safety? How do you really know, you know, the, the efficacy? And can, can you get into this word durability a little bit more? Because I think this is kind of the first time I've heard it and uh, you know as, as far as the the, the health context so um, maybe um, jo Joanne you want to start us off on like the safety and efficacy piece yeah um, so I, I think if you play by the rules and you are testing a new therapy and you obtain an IND from the FDA or an ID if it's a device um, there are built-in guardrails uh, that you have to meet in order to show that you have evidence of safety. Sometimes it's in in vitro systems, sometimes it's animal systems, sometimes it's because the product, like when I'm using cord blood for CP, cord blood has been used for transplant for 30 years. So there's a lot of clinical experience of cord blood in human. So, but there are, you know, you have to provide evidence and a rationale for why there is safety, or if there is not safety, you have to put in a proposal with a clinical trial that looks at safety in a very calculated way, maybe starting at a very low dose and increasing the dose, et cetera. But if, if FDA has a lot of that built into what goes into an IND application. Um, FD, efficacy is a lot harder, particularly I think in cell therapy and particularly for me, working with children in developmental type diseases where normal development changes the function of the child and you have to really look hard to, to be able to prove that you're not seeing a change in what would be developmental occurrences. You really are impacting and changing the course of that child's disease. And that's 
I think really hard to do. We struggle with it all the time. Uh, I don't think parent reported outcome measures are sufficient. I think there's a huge placebo effect there. I'm a parent too, so I'm not saying anything bad about parents. Um, but, but if you're gonna have a therapy that's gonna impact you know, a huge population or even a small population of patients and it's gonna cost money, you really have the obligation to show that it makes a difference. Um, I think your point about um, FDA endpoints are not always meaningful endpoints to patients. I think that's a whole science that we still need to perfect um, and we don't have a good way to do that yet. Um, and, um, you know, durability is relative to me, yeah. Um, but in the diseases I'm working right now, obviously if you can make an impact that sticks and impacts other things in a child's subsequent life, that, that's hugely important. But sometimes if you make a small impact and it's just on a short-term endpoint, it still can be very important. So hard to talk about all of it at once. <laughs> Sure, thank you. And uh, so, I mean, is there a is there an accepted, widely accepted definition of durability? I mean, is it like how long the treatment lasts? Is it how well, can, can you, John, do you wanna chime in there? Sure, so I don't think there's an accepted definition of the length of time because it is disease variable, but the key concept is the following, that the administration benefit of the agent continues well beyond that administration time period. And so if we take an example that we're used to, hypertension, Hypertension medications will drop your blood pressure as soon as you take the medication. But as soon as you stop taking the medication, your blood pressure will return to that high state. With a durable therapy, you administer that therapy and that benefit will continue over time long beyond the initial administration. So that's the key aspect of durability. How that translates in the policy and value is that the pricing or the value of that would have assumed that durability. And so that's why you get the accrual of cost at that acute cost point. Okay. And the reason that I personally use durability versus cure is the following. There can be some conditions where these therapies can deliver marvelous benefits to patients. Does that patient then have not other challenges or other difficulties even within that disease they may well have, but the specific benefit that's been targeted by the, the therapy is still the benefit there, even if they're not fully cured, if you will, of the condition. Jillian. So I've got a clarifying question. So are we prepared to make the assumption that however much benefit you reach is a plateau till the end of time? Because otherwise, the ongoing studies to realize the cost for any subsequent decline become a real hurdle to development, right, as to when do we know what we need to know to make the decision? Yeah, what we've, you know, what we've assumed in the focus project is that we feel a reasonable time periods would be for these conditions, two years for oncology conditions and five years for, for other conditions. And that was taken for two key reasons. One is what is a meaningful effect in a given condition and we, you know, we felt that was a very meaningful condition and would be durable versus taking a tablet every day or an injection every day for a therapy. And then obviously with the gene and cell therapies, if we're assuming that it's durable, five years seem reasonable. The other background to this is of course from a safety perspective to, to uh, the earlier question, these patients are being required to follow the safety for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so seeing, an, you know, a, maintenance of a benefit over five years seemed a reasonable, but there's no hard and fast, Julian. Thank you. I think we have a question in the back. Yes, please identify yourself. Hi, I'm Arthur Allen from Politico. Um, you talk about, you know, an expanding pipeline for these drugs, uh, for these treatments. Um, so let's say in 10 years, whatever number of them are out there, and some are for pretty important um, less rare diseases. Um, my, my question is, uh, how do you, I, I still, I didn't hear anything today that convinced me about how you're gonna tackle, like, or how you conceive of society tackling disparities um, in treatment, and just how we're gonna pay for this in this, I, I mean, are these treatments going to cost $500,000 indefinitely, um, or, 
Or do you anticipate they'll come down? Um, and how do you account for this disparity? Like you mentioned sickle cell. If, if most of the patients are on Medicaid and Medicaid programs can't pay for them, then how do, how do we deal with that? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I'll take it first. Um, so uh, we think that there are about 20 to 30 therapies that will come to market in the next 10 years or so. And the vast majority of them are in small patient populations, hemophilia and sickle cell probably being the largest patient populations. Um, <clears throat> so the budget, if you do the math, the budget impact actually is not enormous. What is potentially enormous is that, again, these are random acts of God. And so the risks associated with any given state and or insurer having one or more of these people who need to be treated in a given year could actually blow budgets. <clears throat> and so that's that's the kind of, that's the, that's the risk that insurers are now facing as these therapies come. Um, will the price come down? Well, um, no, uh, not unless uh, there's true competition within a given therapy and a given, uh, paired with a given indication, just like we've seen with any other therapy. Um, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, well, if we just internalize the manufacturing of these into the hospital, then the cost of manufacturing will come down. Sure, but who's going to capture that value? It's not going to be the healthcare system unless we design it to do so, which we don't do now, so why would we do it then? Um, so I think that we have a real issue, which is that um, we need to start thinking about what our insurance principles are here for providing access irrespective of how you're insured or who you are, um, given that these, some of these therapies are going to come out in populations that we have some uncomfortableness with redistributing to. I'm glad you asked the question because it was um, similar to a question on one of the cards about how to make sure that um, therapies are affordable um, as they come on the market. So I want to, um, I just want to push a little bit more on the question. I mean, you, you talked about insurance. I mean, the purpose of insurance is to protect against risk, right? I, I mean, we're talking about a paradigm shift in therapies. Does there need to be a paradigm shift in coverage? And doesn't, you know, like, is are there targeted ways to think about insurance coverage beyond, like, oh, this small business is, you know, this small business now has to cover a $2 million therapy, or, you know, this state Medicaid program, or that state prison system. Like, how do we need to start thinking about that? So we, uh, again, I think the way to do this is to think through by analogy, which is we have other therapies or other types of disease for which we now have treatment that is quite effective, for which there is an incentive or there is some disparateness in insurance coverage. So there were mental health parity acts um, that swept through the states and ultimately became a federal law, and that essentially instituted a, a kind of set of conditions upon which we are going to provide access. Um, to therapies, because we know that health is good for these individuals, but also it's good for society to actually have um, some basis for coverage. I don't see why we wouldn't want to have some sort of parity laws that look similar to address these issues. You don't have to go all the way towards a federal mandated benefit that, uh, like end-stage renal disease um, to get to a much more assured, even sense of coverage and reimbursement. Okay. I want to go down the line to that. You might hear that as being proposed by some folks. Can I just add one point, which for these conditions that we're talking about in this particular panel, they're very different than our other ongoing medicines in that that benefit once delivered as a, as a gene therapy, that patient should leave the po patient population for that particular condition. Now, that's not to say they won't have other health challenges that need coverage, but once they're treated, they will leave the patient pool 
and you will then be left treating each year with just the incident population, not the prevalent population. And we have a great analogy that we've seen in the real world for that, which is the hepatitis C. Great concern about the bolus of patients and the surge at the beginning, but if we look at what happened there, two factors happened. One was the a quick entrance of another competitor drove down prices, but the most important driver was that patients left the patient pool and the incident population cost much less. That's very different than many other diseases where once someone's being treated for the condition, overall they require being treated for life and that burden is ongoing. And we should not lose sight of that for these rare uh, orphan conditions where we're actually changing them and taking people out of the disease pool that they're currently in. Let me, let me ask a clarifying question about the pipeline. Um, see if uh, maybe Jillian put you on the spot, um, but if others want to chime in. I mean, how many of these drugs that are in the pipeline now or therapies, are, you know, do we think are, are going to be kind of pills? How many of them are going to be kind of a shot? How many of it is like, an, you know, a one-time, you know, massive, like, transplant process like CAR-T? Like, do we have a sense of, of that and, and how that's going to affect the system? I'll certainly defer to others, but I think we're anticipating high-touch care in most of these situations. But I think to the point of the parallel of hep C, you know, we've also got some of these things with biologics in general. And the question is back to what is restored. We have it with RA if people are disabled, but you can mitigate and allow them to continue working. So, I mean, I think the system has a tremendous number of versions of different levels of intensity of care anyway, and there's going to be some variability. But the fact that you're going with gene and cell therapy, understanding the basic mechanism of the disease is very different from historically we had with a pill. And I'm willing to say at this point, I'm not anticipating anything, any of them being a pill in my lifetime. I mean, there is an associated level of diagnosis and care. There is also just to at some level hedge a little bit the act of God, there are going to be some that are genetic tendencies. And, you know, sickle cell is going to be one of them that we have to understand that some of them, if not preventable as diseases per se, they're anticipatable in ways that society may choose to manage. And different societies will choose differently. I mean, this is the other thing. <coughs> when you're developing a therapy, it's often global development, or at least the highly regulated markets, and we are going to have evidence coming in ex-US in situations where we do have a denominator and can look at these things a little bit more differently. So just to add to the mix. So I want to ask a question about competition, because that comes up a lot in these kinds of conversations. I mean, given, you know, it's we're not just making a generic version of a an aspirin or something, and you know, we've gone through this conversation with biologics um, and the sort of follow-on biosimilars. I, is there any meaningful kind of conversation to be had about competition? Like, what does competition even look like when you're talking about a whole process? This is the one good news bit that I'd like to add, is the science is cumulative. <laughs> and so we are learning, to some extent, across platforms on certain of the vectors, certain of the approaches. What is a good clinical way of handling these cells? And having joined Joanne before in, with FACT and the Foundation for the Accreditation of Cell Therapy, there are good practices now that we know are good practices. So there may not be enough trained people, but there are things that we now know we have to do in order to keep cells alive. So I think the doability is based on the experience. And we did have a tragedy a few years back when the whole field took a step backwards. Um, and we do have an incredibly risk-averse and very careful FDA to deal with. But I think the cumulative, model, novel, the cumulative model of the science and the shared experience collectively and the degree to which some of this is public is actually a plus. I uh, agree completely. Um, I think with hepatitis C, there is just straight therapeutic obsolescence. So. Um, new therapies came out, there are competitions between firms, and over time, there are products that don't exist any longer in the market that frankly did provide benefit to people. They're just not as good as the therapies that we now have. Um, and so that is the way the world works. We see it in other consumer products. My view is that given 
These are very small patient populations. Um, it takes a lot of money and a lot of effort and a lot of risk, frankly, to be invested in these. There's no reason that we shouldn't see, particularly for the larger patient subsets, some competition between firms and trying to get to market. Um, whether they'll, they'll not, they will try to, uh, the, these firms will try to split the market into uh, therapeutic indications that are not completely overlapped, we'll see, to try to avoid potential therapeutic observations or, or straight head-to-head -head comparisons, we'll see. But um, my view is that we're not going to see a significant amount of competition between firms in a given therapy indication patient subset pair. Um, and if and when we do, it's likely going to be um, winner-take-all markets where uh, there's just the best one wins. Right. Uh, overall, I agree with that for the, for the orphan. Um, I think for some of the rare ones, there will be competition. Uh, we see that in sickle cell, there's three drugs close to market. We see that in hemophilia B, there's four drugs to market. And I think that will lead to the same market dynamic that was observed in hepatitis. And so that market dynamic will come to play in terms of ensuring that value is achieved. Yep. Um, I, all right, I want to ask, I've, I've got two more questions. At first, I just want to take a look at the room. Does anyone have a question? You can raise your hand, write on a card. We've got about 10 more minutes. All right, I'm going to keep us on the hot seat on um, affordability for a second, and, just, um, and, and then I've got a, a, a second question before we wrap up. So um, price, you know, Rena, you talked a little bit about ICER. Um, we're not going to be able to get into all the details here, but like, talk a little bit about, given that these are very expensive to therapies to, to bring to market, how do we even begin to think about um, what the price should look like? Why don't I have the hard question? <laughs> so, um, Again, reasonable standards of price apply in this market like they do in others. Um, uh, ICER evaluations um, and other cost effectiveness agency evaluations for these type of therapies actually don't vary that much between countries, um, which should tell you something, which is that essentially the pricing behavior of these firms is taking into account the existence of cost effectiveness analysis and coming up with a societal price already. Um, and um, ultimately, um, the value provided will be reflected in the price, but also will be reflected in the coverage and reimbursement levels that are set by the government payers. And so the value perception from the firm's perspective, sure, their goal is to try to extract their monopolist, their goal is to try to extract as much revenue as possible from the industry, but there is a limit. And that limit has to do with coverage and access. We are already seeing with the CAR T therapies that there are very significant hurdles for patients receiving access to this therapy. And so sure, we're willing to pay high prices for them, but that is not translating into very significant revenue because the quantity is lower than it needs to be. So there are trade-offs. All right, I wanna ask a question about sort of equity and access. And I, I mean, we, we talked about, you know, these are, these are not a picnic, these therapies. Um, Joanne, you talked about um, the, the, you know, the, the babies having to, to go into the MRI machine twice and, or more, like, can you talk a little bit about equity as it relates kind of from the very beginning all the way through access? How do we ensure um, equitable um, research, diversity in research, and, and, and then, you know, patient access, um, you know, beyond just the, the actual physical cost of the therapy, but the, the other costs that are associated with getting um, the therapy? I guess that's for me. I mean, it's very, very complicated, okay? Um, so in the clinical trials, I do the cost of the trial is covered. The family actually gets um, a travel reimbursement and um, money to cover their time in, in Durham when they're getting studies done for the trial. Um, but 
there in our autologous cord blood trials, for example, unless you had an autologous cord blood unit bank, which cost money at the time of birth, um, the family didn't have access to the trial. And in our first trial, all the patients were pretty much from California, and they all <laughs> banked in a couple of big West Coast pub private cord blood banks. So, uh, you know, that's an extreme example of how just being in a certain demographic controlled access to the study. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think when you're providing care, particularly complicated care, uh, it's not just about covering the cost of whatever the therapy is, because that's kind of, not that it's not hard, but that's the lower hanging fruit to me. Mm -hmm. So in my transplant program, we have a family support program, and that pays for all the stuff that medical care doesn't cover for families who are coming for weeks or months at a time, because they have other expenses at home. They have travel expenses. They come without winter jackets, and it gets cold. They need to, you know, food for the kid in the hospital is provided, but not for the mom or the dad. I mean, very basic kinds of um, needs that people have when they're out of their normal community and not home and getting care, particularly for a child with a desperate illness, um, come up. And we don't have an adequate way in our society, as far as I'm concerned, to pay for any of that. I mean, people do it by hook or crook, and they, there's GoFundMes, and there's programs that have programs, but there's no organized ways to address this. And I think it says that healthcare is not just about the price of the drug. Yeah, I, I, I can only totally agree with that. I think there's a huge hidden cost with these therapies on the families, which is a significant burden, especially given the demographics, unfortunately, of many of these families. I think my point on equity of access and the, the slow walking of access, like we've talked about at CAR-T, is, is to enter into value-based agreements. If there's a question, there's clearly no question that these patients are eligible. It's very clear that whether they have a genetic condition or not, this isn't something that needs to be debated endlessly whether they have these conditions or not. The condition's clear. The point is, can the system afford it? And I think the system overall shouldn't be arguing about that. They should be arguing about, let's put in place where we establish the benefits established. And if the benefit's established, then we pay. But if the benefit isn't established, which is the hidden question, then we don't pay. And I think we should put more energy into establishing these value-based agreements, milestone-based contracts, and annuities give people the access, see what the real benefits are, and then reassess the challenge. If we always start with the barrier, patients don't get access and we'll never understand the real value of these medicines. Thank you. All right, we got about four minutes left, so here's the hardest question of all. In like one minute each, what excites you the most and what gives you the most pause about cell and gene therapies? I think the fact that we're now on a road where we agree they work and we have a few approvals, science is cumulative, and so therefore we've got that hope. We just have to work out the mechanics of ensuring at some level that those that can benefit the most can access even if not everybody can benefit. And I do worry in broader sense on who's deciding and on what basis, because the good news is that binary decision up front, but then the level of benefit and what it's worth to whom is a tough one. So I think these are incredibly promising therapies and that they will be the next big advances in the next decade or two of medicine. I think we're beyond drugs um, and into something much more powerful, but I think we're at the, we're in the infancy, we're one day old. Um, and we had, there's so much work to do. And it, I think proving that which therapy has efficacy or not, and then figuring out the logistics of manufacturing and access are incredibly challenging and doable, but, but not trivial. Certainly what excites me is the potential to truly transform patients' lives. And I think in the case of pediatric disease, families' lives, um, I think that's, that's why we, we all do what we do. What worries me the most is that we're trying to judge these therapies and their potential benefit in a system that's been dealing with, with chronic uh, small molecule medications. And, and I think to apply that system to these breakthrough therapies is a big mistake and uh, doesn't, rel you know, doesn't really show and shine the value that's being delivered. And so I think it really is behoven on 
all stakeholders to take a new look and say, isn't this the first group of medications you'd actually fund and fund appropriately? And you'd look at those other medications somewhat differently and see how you redeploy value to these things that can really make a huge difference to people's lives. Um, the ability to transform people's lives for the better, I think, is what's so exciting. I think I am very, very optimistic that payers and policymakers can come to some good rules of thumb here about making sure that these therapies are accessible to those who really will benefit from them and will still pay innovators what they need in order to keep on bringing the new technologies to us. Thank you so much. So um, we have covered a lot of ground today. I think we could drill down into um, about 20 different topics and, and have another hour and a half panel on, on each of them. Um, for those of you who want to learn more, I really do want to commend in your packets and also on the Alliance website, there's a list of recommended reading um, that I think there's some really good resources there um, if you want to um, take some home over the holidays and delve into this some more. We have a list of experts um, as well who have agreed to be contacted for um, additional background. Um, so with that, um, I want to um, invite you in the name of um, value and innovation, fill out those blue evaluation forms. We really do use them. Um, I want to thank um, our sponsors for making today's briefing possible and our entire signature series on navigating the frontiers of value innovation and innovation. And please join me in thanking our panel. <laughs>